I'm speaking tonight about Al-Hamdani and a specific chapter in one of his major works on the origin of the present capital of Yemen, Sana'a, and the royal palace of Sana'a, which in its time was the most majestic building in the Arabian Peninsula. Al-Hamdani traveled much as a young man. He obviously wanted to know the world firsthand from his own experience. He traveled everywhere in the Arabian Peninsula. He may even have been to where Kuwait is today because he was also traveling the land of what is today Iraq. He then decided that he would drink at the sources of Elm of Science in Makkah. And he established himself in Makkah, but above all, he felt as a Yemeni, as a Yemeni nationalist, as we shall see, and as somebody proud of the historical baggage which Yemen carries. And therefore, he traveled almost everywhere in Yemen. The Yemen, its main parts, as you know, the mountains, Al Murtafa'at, the flat Tihama on the Red Sea, the southern regions, and Hadramut, which were never one country in history and which he also deals with as separate countries forming the Yemen in the sense of a geographical unity, meaning the South. He wrote a number of highly important encyclopedias or encyclopedic works. The most important one called Al-Iqlil, The Crown, which consists of 10 books dealing with the history of Yemen from the very beginning, its biblical Quranic origins to the end of the pre-Islamic period, the end of the kingdom of Himya. This is Al-Iqlil. He also wrote an incredibly detailed work on the geography of the Arabian Peninsula, simply called Description of the Peninsula of the Arabs, Safa Jazirat al-Arab. These two books are basically geographical, but as it happens with Arab historians, and he was a historian, he explains history not in the way we are accustomed to explain it in Europe as a sequence of events, but as and through a sequence of genealogies. So genealogies explain affiliations, tribal movements, establishment of states, disappearance of states, and they establish, above all, the current situation of geography linked with the human presence. In this sense, as the historian of the tribes of Southern Arabia, Hamdani is, I will use in my talk, indifferently the correct form, Al-Hamdani or Hamdani. Hamdani is for the south, what Ibn Al-Kalbi is for the northern tribes. It is the basis of the self-understanding of the Arabs for the whole Middle Ages and the pre-modern times. And even today, I think even here in Kuwait, many people feel themselves attached to a particular tribe, even if it is not fully visible. At this point, I have to 
explain something which may be coming as a surprise to you. We use the word tribe in Arabic, qabila. We use it in a rather nonchalant way. This is not correct. We understand a tribe as something of an organization derived from a common ancestor and defined by that ancestor. Normally, as I have said before, this is fictional. It is fictional because Arab history is written through a history of genealogies which are made into fitting into historical events and not the other way round. So this is the one thing. But in South Arabia, in Yemen, there were no tribes of this kind. There were units called Sha'ab, plural Shu'ub, which in modern Arabic means people, plural peoples. A Yemeni Sha'ab was not a tribe in the sense of a common ancestor. It was a political unity whose rulers may have been hereditary or not. So the ruler of a Sha'ab was somehow elected, designated through various processes, but the people themselves did not feel as a grouping with a common ancestor. Only during the Islamic period, maybe from the time of Al Hamdani onwards, did the southern Arabs, the Yemenis, change their political system into the idea of tribes. The Himyaritic past is only the last period of South Arabian history. The state of Himya established itself or rather its chronology beginning from a year zero or rather a year one in what we would call the year 110 BC. It is the last one of the South Arabian empires. The oldest one, Sabah, which is also, as you all know, mentioned so many times in the holy book of Islam. The oldest one, Sabah, was established much earlier, around the year 1000 BC. So the southern Arabs constructed, and Hamdani was possibly the main voice in this, and indeed he is called, until the present day, Lisan al-Yemen, the tongue of Yemen. He constructed the uh, idea of the great and grand past of southern Arabia, the kingdom of Himya. Hamdani lived, as I said, in Makkah, but then as a man in his younger middle ages returned to Yemen in order to travel everywhere, he did not wish, contrary to all the other Muslim historians and geographers of his time. He did not wish to write his books from copying quotes from other books as it happened at the same time in Europe because at the same time when the Abbasid court discovered antiquity in Baghdad, Europe made an enormous effort to collect the texts, those very texts from antiquity in order to copy them and to study them at the very same time under Charlemagne. We do have a very similar movement in both worlds at the very same time. But both the scholars in Baghdad and the scholars in Europe basically worked on the texts from antiquity and did not feel the urge to travel around to study inscriptions and to get their geographical knowledge 
from their own first-hand insights. Hamdani is a uniquely modern man. He was not equaled until 600 years later by, no, less than that, Ibn Khaldun, uh, and has no equal in his time in Europe either. I will, as I said, I will come back to his history and geography, but let me finish his life. He was very outspoken politically. At this time, in the early um, uh, uh, 10th century uh, AD, the uh, how should I say um, the Im later who became later the imams of Yemen, the um, called uh, the movement Zaidia, but at that time the word Zaidia was not yet used. So clearly a descendant of the Prophet, or rather of Fatima uh, and Ali, came to Yemen and established a state centered on the northern town of Saada. This person, this imam, was called Al-Hadi Yahya, Al-Hadi Al -Hadi Il Al-Haq Yahya, and he was the first imam, and as a descendant of Prophet Muhammad, legitimized his taking the power in Yemen, or at least in northern Yemen, legitimized it with his descendants. To the great annoyance of Yemenis who felt that they would be dominated by strangers coming from the north. And Hamdani made himself the mouthpiece of these feelings and attacked the imams, at, in his time it was already the son of Imam Yahya, attacked them as northerners, as foreigners, as people whose only claim was that they descended through blood from somebody, but who might not have the qualification, the knowledge, and the capacity, intellectual above all, to be a ruler. He explained this in such sharp words that he was imprisoned by the imam for several years. Then he was freed. He continued his bows and his attacks. He was imprisoned again. Followers of his made a kind of revolution, liberated him, and the last 20 or 30 years of his life, he spent them and he was able to spend them under the protection of a Yemeni lord of pre-Islamic origins in the town of Raida, halfway between Sana'a and Sa'ada. I will now talk a few minutes about another work by Al-Hamdani, which will show you his method and how he felt himself that he should address technical and, well, technical and philosophical questions. This is called, and then we will come back to his history. Kitab al-Jawharatayn al hadqatayn the book of the two venerable, beautiful metals, gold and silver. In this book, he does, of course, quote the authorities from Aristoteles onwards, but if you compare it with the great and well-known Arab and Persian scholars who wrote about these matters, such as Al-Ghazi, Al-Biruni, Ibn Sina, you will immediately discover that Hamdani 
surpassed them enormously. These three, exactly like their counterparts in Europe, who wrote about these matters at the very same time, limited themselves to quote the Bible in Europe and the Quran, and then to continue to quote the writers of antiquity from Aristoteles to Ptolemaios uh, and uh, Eratosthenes. Not so Hamdani. He knew Aristoteles, but he does not quote what Aristoteles said about the subject. He quotes him for some philosophical questions, but then he jumps into the matter. He describes the mines, the gold and silver mines in Yemen, whom he, which he visited all personally. Then he describes in great detail the method of how the stones and the minerals are being crushed, are being washed, are being cupellated with sulfur, with mercury, um, what kind of, um, of melting pots uh, should be used, what size, how remains of the ore in the, uh, in the crushed stone could be retrieved. It is all first-hand knowledge. This level, this level of scholarly scientific description has not been reached until the Renaissance in Europe and the 19th century here in the Arab world. He then continues to speak about minting of the coins, which is obvious, the gold and the silver continues with the coins. His is the only practical detailed description in the whole corpus of Arab medieval writing on how to mint coins, how to make the dyes, how to, uh, from which steel, he then makes an excursus to Yemeni steel, the Yemeni sword, as Saif al-Yamani, the Hindi sword, al-Hindiya, etc. And then he explains how this is being made, and he ends how to make fakes. We will now come back. Oh, I forgot to mention this, of course, he knew also firsthand. His uncle was the essay master of the mint in Sana'a, and Hamdani obviously spent much time in the office of his uncle checking and looking and experimenting with the details of the minting process. Hamdani, as I said at the beginning, glorified above all the great kings of Himyar. And amongst them, their greatest, which whose name is Abikarib As'ad, which later Arab historians Arabicized into Abu Karib As'ad, also called As'ad Tub'a. He ruled in the fourth century and was the first one to unite the Arab Peninsula. This may also come as a surprise to you. You may have learned at school that it was under Muhammad, the prophet, that the Arab Peninsula was first united. This is not correct. It was united under Abi Karib As'ad almost 300 years earlier. Abi Karib As'ad, of course, ruled over Yemen for a very long time over 50 years, part of it as a sole ruler, part of it with brothers, the later part with one or two, with two of his sons. And during his very long period, he expanded Yemeni political influence over the whole of the peninsula. If I say he expanded, one would think first of all about Mecca, but he did not expand over Mecca because Mecca belonged to Saudi Arabia and to Yemen at that time and had belonged to it 
for quite a while before. So his armies were fighting, as we have learned from an inscription which was recently found about 40 kilometers north of Ariad, his armies battled in, in, um, in the Najd, his armies battled in Al Hassa, his armies battled in the north uh, near the Syrian border. One can say that not only in a sense of some belonging, but in a sense of real political sovereignty, his kingdom or rather empire encompassed most of the Arabian Peninsula. And no wonder, no wonder that Hamdani chooses this man as an example for the greatness of the Yemeni past and of its superiority over the Arabs of the north, including not their prophet, he was a very devoted Muslim, Hamdani, but over the claims of the descendants of the prophet for political rule in the Arabian Peninsula, including the Yemen. I would like to mention two more things which happened during the reign of uh, Abi Karib Asad um, in the from ruling, as I said, from roughly, we do not know exactly, but from the year 400 AD to the year 450 AD. Um, uh, in his time, the move of Yemen from polytheism to monotheism, which was already initiated by his predecessor, was completed. So under Abi Karib Asad, we have even linguistically the antecedents of the Quran. He introduced the denomination of the one God as Ar-Rahman. The other denomination was Lord of heaven and earth. We find both expression, as you all know, in the Quran, but they go back to the time of Abi Karib Asad. As I said, Mecca belonged, had belonged for a very long time to the cultural realm of southern Arabia, of Yemen, but under Abu Abi Karib Asad, it was firmly integrated into South Arabia's political structures. It is said that Abi Karib was the first one to cover the Kaaba with a kiswa. The kiswa was made in southwest Yemen in Ma'afir from Ma'afiri cloth. He is also said to have been the first one to have provided a golden key for the Kaaba. Abi Karib Asad, according to Hamdani, but this is surely not historically true, but rather a poetic line invented by Hamdani, was the one who coined that famous Arab proverb, inna atharuna tadullu alayna faunduru badna ilal athar. Look at what we have left. And these are the things which remain from our life and our reign. Hamdani devotes about 10 or 15 pages, which is to be expected, to the capital of Yemen, Sana'a, and its magnificent palace. According to Hamdani, Sana'a was founded by Sam bin Nuh, Sem, the son of Noah, which is, of course, historically impossible. But uh, he says, 
after the uh, deluge, some did not find the climate in the north where the arch had landed. Very pleasant. Syria, eastern Turkey, Iraq, unpleasant place for an Arab. And he set out to Yemen, which is such a pleasant place with oasis and mountains and water and found a large, a large um, uh, valley, the valley where Sana'a is constructed today, and decided to build his abode in this place. So he wanted to start building it and led out his measuring rod. But what happened? A big bird came, took the rod, flew away about five or six kilometers, dropping it slightly in a slightly different place. Clearly, some, somehow a prophet, I mean, Nuh was a prophet, so his son is a half prophet, understood that this was a sign of God and built Sana'a where the bird had dropped his measuring rod. So Sana'a was built there and obviously has a story, a history of uh, divine inspiration. Historically, this is not true. Sana'a was built or founded roughly around the birth of Christ. The capital of the kingdom of Saba was Marib in the east. I did mention before that Himya began counting its era in the year 110 BC. Why did this happen? The caravan trade, which made the richness of South Arabia, went through the desert, from Yemen, through Makkah, to the north, to Gaza, and the other one to Gara, which is near modern-day Kuwait. No, this did not last. Around the second, early first century before Christ, trade to India moved to the sea, through the Red Sea, from Egypt to India with basically Aden halfway being the main stopping point where the merchants from Egypt met those coming back from India. And clearly this delocalization of the trade deprived the capital cities of South Yemen of their logistic importance. They had to move towards the west. And that is why Himya emerged, which controlled the Red Sea coast and the southern coast around Aden in Yemen. Within this process, Himya established its capital in the city of Lafar, but very soon built a second capital in Sana'a. We do have the earliest inscription mentioning Sana'a. The word, by the way, does not mean what uh, uh, Sunya Sana'a means in modern Arabic. It means, uh, uh, it has a slightly different meaning. It means fortress. Um, built, was built as a fortress around the birth of Christ or in the middle of the first century. And in this town, at somewhat later, the main and most magnificent palace which the Arab Peninsula had ever seen before was built, larger and more beautiful than the palace of Himya in Bafar itself and larger than the palace in Marib, the palace of Rumdan. Hamdani attributes the palace to several Himya kings Amongst them, of course, Abi Karib As'ad, well, uh, but uh, uh, also to others. And he describes it very vividly. He describes it very vividly as having 10 floors, each floor 10 dira. Dira, there's no word in English. Uh, the dictionaries say yard, but a yard is different. So it is. 
This length 45 centimeters, which was also used as a measurement together with feet in Europe in the Middle Ages. So 10 dura is 4 meter 50, roughly. So 10 floors, 4 meter 50 high, and then he describes it that the floors became smaller, so a large ground floor, a smaller second floor, slightly smaller third, etc. And the tenth floor had a roof made of very thin alabaster so that when the king relaxed on his bed in the tenth floor, lie, led on his bed and looked through this sheet of alabaster towards the sky, it was so luminous and so transparent that he could distinguish a crow or a raven from a kestrel. Hamdani continues with more details. On top of the roof of this palace, and then he speaks, I must make this excursus, he speaks, of course, of Qasr, the palace, but then he speaks of Qusur. And it seems that Qasr, the Rumdan, the palace of Rumdan, did in fact consist of three or four Qusur side by side, jambila jamb. So he describes these Qusur in more detail, covered with marble, with reliefs, with statues on the outlying corners of the various floors which became smaller and smaller, but particularly decorated on the highest floor on the corners with statues of lions in bronze and of ibexes in bronze and with bells hanging in between those lions and the ibexes. And the lions were made with um, the lost wax method. They were uh, not massive, but uh, uh, had, whole, had a hole inside, and their mouth was wide open. So when the winds were blowing, the winds entered those statues of lions, making them roar. So this is the description of the palace. Oh, I forgot, even some eagles' heads on, on, um, on, the, um, uh, on the top. And now I introduce you to the most sensational archaeological discovery in Arabia in the last few decades. These are some rock paintings which were found in Khaulan, about 40 kilometers east of Sana'a, on, on, on a wall of a rock which was protected for the last 1,700 years or so by an overcharging part of that rock so that weather conditions did not affect the paintings. And what do we see there? Well, this is not yet, this is reality in Saudi Arabia. This is one of those townhouses. I choose one in Hadramaut, not built from stone, but from uh, mud bricks. Uh, this is, of course, Shibam. And here we are. I have to see myself. Yes. This is uh, in, in Khaulan, uh, Khaulan at Yal. This is the rock above there. Inside the cave, you have the lower photograph. And now we come, well, you may already see there is something on the wall. And what do we see here? Isn't that interesting? We see a castle above there. We see another castle with a majestic entrance. Here we see the entrance with the four guards brandishing their swords, preventing people from 
coming too near, throw the hustle button. Uh, and on the right, we see a third palace. And in between, we see a Nahla, a very tall Nahla. Hamdani mentions the Nahla. It had a name. It was so famous, it had a name. Where is it? I forgot. Where is the Adaia? The palm tree was called Adaia, and it was famous in the whole of Yemen, being so tall as the ten floors of Qasr Rumdan. Here you see the top floor. On the right, no, on the right one you can see that the floors are not straight, but the left one is somewhat straight. And you see that on top of the pinnacles, you see the pinnacles on top? And on top of the pinnacles, uh, while the photograph does not render it perfectly, you see statues. And on the original and some other photographs, you can distinguish that on the pinnacles, these statues show ibexes and lions. So clearly, or sadly, or unfortunately, it is not labeled, it doesn't say, painted by Mohammed uh, ibn Leonardo da Vinci uh, in the year uh, 432. But, um, uh, so it is not signed, but it is clear this is Rumdan. It is the most majestic palace that stood on the Arabian Peninsula. Um, I have one minute left, I think. So um, this one minute will just allow us to uh, address the, after so much history, the eternal essence of uh, feminity. feminity. Um, Hamdani, in describing Sana'a, describes its climate. He says, it is fresh, it can be cold, but it is always pleasant. It is never too hot, which is true. He says the water is very, very good. Fruit is growing in a wonderful way. People are pleasant. They know all kind of harafiat, of trades. But especially noteworthy are the women of Sana'a and what he says. The women are pious, honest, knowledgeable, well-dressed. No woman in the world equals the Sana'ani woman in beauty. No woman in the world equals the Sana'ani woman in character. No woman in the world equals the Sana'ani woman in grace. But, 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 they are jealous, coquettish, and enjoy flattering. Thank you very much. <laughs>